Hey there, welcome to Authentically Raw. I'm your host, Jamie Darris. Today's guest is Karen Hall. She's a life coach, speaker, writer, and also a podcaster of The Hero Within. And if you love talking or hearing about being an empath, being highly sensitive, or maybe you have the intuition to deeply kind of connect with other people, you feel things deeply, you feel other people's emotions, this conversation is for you. But even if this isn't you, it's also for you because I am sure you have those types of people in your life. And we talk a lot about validation too, and how we often invalidate one another's feelings and emotions without even realizing that we're doing it. And the importance of creating safe spaces for the people in our lives to share how they feel and help others uh, manage and regulate their emotions. So tune in. It's great. I was two pounds, 10 ounces when I was born. So my mom was told that I would die. And um, they, back in those days, they, they didn't let the mom hold the baby, you know, or touch, touch me. And she couldn't nurse me or anything like that. So the nurse which it just had me in the incubator and I just stayed in there for two and a half months until my due date in July when I came home. So um, anyway, my, my mom said that she had to put her hands through these big, thick, heavy gloves if she wanted to hold me. And then, but she still, you know, she couldn't touch me or anything, but, it, but I did live and um, I lost weight though. <laughs> and I went down to one pound, 13 ounces. And so they told my mom, well, she's a fighter and she's living, but, um, but she's probably going to be, um, you know, male retarded or a vegetable. Mm-hmm. So, but I wasn't, <laughs> I, I continued to thrive and I finally came home and, but my mom was so scared that I was going to die, that it was difficult for her to attach to me. And, um, and just being without her attachment or anybody's attachment, you know, I'm sure that was very terrifying for me. I, my mom says that I, um, she could see that, that how it had affected me because I was just so sensitive. Like, like I get startled with sounds or um, I, like I, I just recognize things before they're happening. And sometimes, um, sometimes like I remember one time when I was about 10 years old, I came home from school and I told my mom, the teacher yelled at me today. And my, and I was a very obedient child. You know, I was very conscientious. And my mom's like, what, <laughs> you know, what happened? And I said, she was yelling at me and telling me to be quiet. And my mom was like, well, I better go down and talk to her and find out what's going on. You know? So she goes down and talks to the teacher. And the teacher said, I told the class, class, be quiet. <laughs> and so I thought she was talking to me. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and that was a pattern that I recognized in myself, that if somebody was having strong emotions or something, especially if they looked at me <laughs> you know, when they were expressing something, I took it personally and um, and there were many people in my life that had strong emotions and, and I didn't really understand and I was always wondering why do people act that way I remember asking my mom and dad that question all the time why is that person being mean you know why do they do that my dad's a psychologist and so probably get some of that from him and my mom loves to learn about people but anyway that curiosity served me because um because I, I, I knew in my heart that it wasn't me, even though it felt like it was me. I knew it wasn't me. So I was always trying to figure out what's going on with them. <laughs> Why? What, what's happening inside there, you know, that's causing mm-hmm. them to act that way. And um, so that's what led me to become a life coach was because wow. I, I was always, I have always been searching. I mean, I have journals that I wrote when I was, you know, a young girl. And I was, I was just always curious about why people behave the way they do. But as far as my interactions with people, I was also very curious about that because um, when I got my feelings hurt, say somebody (laughs) did mean it intentionally toward me, they were, they were yelling at me to be quiet or something and and it hurt my feelings. It would hurt so deeply because I felt things so deeply and, and, and that's part of the sensitive nature that I have, but I also didn't realize I'm also an empath. And so I, um, I just, I just feel everything. <laughs> I feel joy intensely. I feel sorrow intensely. I just feel things intensely. So I would get stuck in trying to get out of that emotion because first of all, I'd be baffled. <laughs> Why did this happen? Why is this person doing that thing? 
and then I would I would feel sad or hurt or whatever and then I would have a hard time you know recovering from that and so um, so my mom worked with me when I was a little girl to, to try and and um, you know work through those feelings and try and talk about it and because sometimes I didn't even have the words you know to express it it would just hurt so bad I couldn't really talk about it but um, but anyway, I learned to express it, and I and I then I learned to have the courage to talk to the person that I was having the issue with, and um, and then as I as I left home and I, I I was in college and I had roommates and I was living with all these different different roommates, you know, right. each semester I'd have different people and dating and and getting married and um, all these different personalities that I was interacting with. Um, I I realized that I needed to do some work on me. Mm-hmm. And that I needed to, 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 I was, one of my best friends um, was in sales. And so she was always talking to me about, you know, having positive thoughts and, and listening. I didn't even know there were words up there. <laughs> I didn't even, I didn't really like hear, like I didn't pay attention to it. So I started listening and there was all kinds of chatter up there. <laughs> I was just talking away up there and I thought, this is so funny. I'm so talkative. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um and so I recognized that I could talk more positively to myself. I wasn't very negative with myself, but um, like I like I've talked to other people, and they'll like if they lock their keys in the car, they'll say, "What do you say?" And I say, "Well, in my head, I'll say, I can't believe I did that." And and I say, "What do you say?" And they'll say, oh, "I'm just so, so stupid." You know, I didn't say those kinds of things to myself, but I did say things that were not empowering. And so as I as I started listening. Um, sometimes I would be like worried about what would happen in the future. And I would think mm-hmm. oh, that's going to turn out bad or whatever. This little thing was going to lead to something bad. And and one of the things that I recognized in my, so I had a bit of anxiety. I started developing some anxiety after I was married and I realized that I would start to go 20 years down the road and I would have to catch myself and say, okay, whoa, 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 let's just come back to tonight. What do you have to make for dinner? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I would just laugh when I would when I would have to like reel myself back in. Mm-hmm. So that was so there were some things that I learned about my own thoughts that were really powerful. Mm-hmm. And so then I learned about emotional regulation. And that was absolutely mm-hmm. fascinating to me because um, I remember going through some really difficult challenges and and I was praying about it and I was trying to figure out. I would often ask God, how do you see this situation? Can you tell me what you think about this? Because this looks like pretty, you know, awful to me, but mm-hmm. what can you see? And he, and he would open my eyes and I would ask him to do that. I would say, please open my eyes and please help me see this the way you do. And I remember one day I was just really feeling discouraged and he said, move your camera. And I'm, I'm a photographer. And so he said, take your camera and shift your focus. He said, you can either focus on this and it's true and it's accurate it is a mess right now (laughs) or you can look over here at the blessings that you have and you can look at at all these good things and I was and because I'm a photographer that just spoke to my heart and I have used that technique with many many people you can you can look at this there's good there's bad there's hard there's easy there's you know I think Tony Robbins says it um I, I can't remember how he words it but he says something about how you can look for what's wrong and you can find it or you can look for what's right and you can find it so i was working to look for what was right but sometimes when things got so hard i really couldn't i, I had a hard time seeing anything that was right and so um so that that little technique was very empowering for me so karen you mentioned that you feel things deeply and you're an empath and i relate to that a lot because i've been told that i'm too sensitive my whole life. And I've tried to act tough, act like things don't bother me or let things roll off, have thicker skin, let it go. And what I really did is just stuff all of my emotions down until then they would come exploding out. And then I was really too sensitive, right? But in the last few years, especially, I feel like there's a lot of stuff out there on it's okay to be highly sensitive. It's super beneficial. You're empathetic. You have more compassion and grace for people. And if used properly, I think for ourselves too, tell me what you, or what does it mean to you to be more highly sensitive or an empath? So, um, 
so yes, I heard that same thing. The whole, the whole time I was growing up, my mom would just get exasperated with me, you know, and she would just say, you're so sensitive because I would get my feelings hurt. <laughs> and to her, it didn't seem like it was something to get my feelings hurt over, but I did. And, um, and she saw how I felt things so strongly. So she was always trying to help me, you know, not be so sensitive. <laughs> and so I believed that that was a bad thing about myself. And I felt a lot of shame about being so sensitive. And, and so um, thankfully, my dad loved to listen to me to tell him everything. My mom was a little busier, you know, with the rest of the kids and, and taking care of things. But, but when my dad got home, um, he had to, he had to walk a lot when he, um, he had a heart problem. So he had to walk a lot. So I would go on walks with him and I would just tell him everything. <laughs> he just, he loved to listen. So thankfully I had his undivided attention where he didn't think I was too sensitive. Little did I know <laughs> until I grew up a little bit more that he was extremely sensitive. <laughs> and my dad could, he, he would like, he almost had the gift of prophecy where he could tell you things that were going to happen with people. I mean, he did tell us things that were going to happen with people. And he told us things that were going on with people that he had no knowledge of. No, like we'd be strangers and, and we'd visit with them like we were touring somewhere, you know, and then he would tell my mom, this is what's going on with them. And my mom would say, how do you know? And he's like, I just, I just felt it. And then we'd meet up with them again later, you know, like the next day or whatever, we'd be on another tour together. And, <laughs> and they start pouring out all this stuff that my dad <laughs> said was going on. And we were all together. So it wasn't like, you know, they had secretly told him this thing. It was just like uncanny. This happened over and over again. So my dad told me as I was growing up, you have this gift where you can pick up on things. So I, I appreciated that he said that about me, but the message that I was too sensitive was really loud. And that's the one that I kind of attached to for a while until I got a little bit older. And I, and because I felt that shame, I started, I started feeling like I really want to be able to get over things quicker. I want to be able to look at this different. And, and as I was working on those skills, and I was asking God to help me see me, not just to see the situation and to see the other person, but then to see me the way he saw me. You know, he reminded me, this is a gift. And your dad was right. <laughs> this is a gift I gave you. And I gave it to you so that you can be in tune with other people. And, and I heard a quote um, by Marianne Williamson. And she said that suffering gives us x-ray vision into the suffering of others. And, and I trained with her. She was a, a mentor that I trained as a life coach. And I was so grateful for that message because I thought, oh, that is exactly how it works for me because I do feel things. And I've talked to people, like I've never gone through a divorce, but I've talked to people that have, and they say, you act like you know how this feels. <laughs> and, and I just, I just understand, you know, some things I don't understand everything, but I understand those feelings. I, I understand loneliness. I understand, you know, some of the feelings that they're, that they're feeling. And I can, I can feel the feeling of what they're feeling. So I didn't know back then that it was going to benefit me as a life coach and it was going to benefit me in my relationships and, and things like that. But when I, but when I really did believe that it was a gift, that's when, that's when things changed a lot for me in my life. And I still default, like sometimes I still get my feelings hurt deeply. <laughs> sometimes it still takes me a long time to get over it. And I still feel like I should be over this by now. And then I'm like, I, you know, I have little mantras that I use. It's okay. It can take as long as it takes. <laughs> and I just love myself through the process and connect with someone. I, I always, that is like one of the most beneficial things I can do is find community somewhere and connect with someone. Mm -hmm. And then I'm able to, you know, to, to regulate those emotions a little bit more easily. So I love the, like, I have this picture in mind of you walking with your dad and it's interesting to me, the correlation, um, how, so your dad was highly sensitive and you are, and you make this connection and it's this one-on-one -on -one thing. So I see how that has carried on, you know, in your future as a life coach, you can feel what other people are feeling. And he could feel that in you and you could feel it in him, even though you didn't, you know, you're a kid, you weren't aware of what was really going on here. You're yeah. struggling with, oh, I'm too sensitive. And at that point as a kid, as it should be, um, it is all about you. And 
it's, you know, how, how do I need to manage these emotions or not express them because, you know, it might make mom uncomfortable or some other people. And, you know, how do I just simmer down and not get my feelings hurt? But what it was really priming you for is, hey, I have all these feelings. I relate to you. When I see you going through things, I can empathize with you. I have compassion. I, I get it. I understand. And now, yeah, being highly sens sensitive is a gift that you are using to help those other people that aren't so in tune with their emotions and don't know how to regulate their emotions. And it, it's 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 crazy to me, you know, just hearing that story and how, you know, had you not had those walks with your dad and that time to really develop that gift starting there, the voices in society that say, you know, you, you know, you're, you're too sensitive, like it's some curse and really right. it was such a gift. And had you not followed that gift, you know, what, what would you be doing? Would you be yeah. able to your emotions? Would you be that wife that's just anxious, you know, and it's, it's coming out to your kids and your husband and, and, you know, you do, you wonder about that. Um, yeah. How, I don't know if you remember, it could be more of a feeling. How do you think, you said your dad was a psychologist. Mm -hmm. How do you think your mindset was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, almost kind of primed for how you are now? Because there's, a, the mindset work is is a lot of our reality. How does that play into it? Yeah, um, well, one of the things was that um, I felt safe talking about my feelings. And so I didn't stuff them. I am very willing to, <laughs> I'm very willing to talk about my feelings and I need to talk about my feelings. And if somebody will provide a safe space for me, that is the thing that helps me to regulate the quickest is if I feel safe and I can talk about it. It's my first thing I want to do when I'm, when my, I'm escalated. So I want to talk to somebody who can I call? <laughs> and, um, and so that was the first thing was that it was okay to feel the way that I did. And it was okay to express the way that I, that however I needed to express it. And, um, and that I was loved no matter what. And the other thing he always told me I was Miss America oh. and, um, and that I could do anything. And he would tell me like visions of me, you know, like you're going to be this and I can see you doing this. And so many of the things that he saw, I am doing. He told me I should be a therapist. <laughs> I didn't become a therapist. He, he said a child psychologist specifically because I thought it would be too long to go to school. But he said, you have this gift. You need to do this. And um, and he would watch me with my kids and he would just marvel you know and he would just tell me i'm just in awe of the way you handle that you know with your kids and and, and he said i still think <laughs> you know you should do this and so but he gave me um i always knew my dad believed i could do it even when i didn't feel confident and i felt scared about things and he, and my dad's passed away now he's been gone for 20 years but um but i still feel him by me i still hear him you know say those things to me and so it totally shaped my mindset in that I knew he thought I could do it. And I, I remember when I was in college and I, um, it was so hard <laughs> and right. And I, and I didn't get straight A's this time. I got a B, you know, when I got a C, oh my gosh, I got a C. <laughs> and I called my dad and I was like, oh, I feel terrible. You know, and I was just so discouraged. And he said, I'm so glad you got a C. And I said, you are? And he said, yes. He goes, I'd much rather have a, a, a child that gets B's and C's and is well-rounded. He goes, that's awesome. Keep dating. Because I was dating a lot more than I had in high school, you know. And, and so he was like, that's awesome. You just keep doing just what you're doing. He goes, it's all great. And I was like, oh, wow. Because he didn't want me to just be like, just, mm -hmm. you know, book, 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 <laughs> kind of thing. And so, um, so, yeah, so he gave me an inner confidence that, Oftentimes people, when they are curious about me and about how have you been able to do that thing, you know, I, and, and then they learn about my dad, they're like, oh, now it makes sense, you know, so he, very powerful impact. Yeah. And I feel like you are carrying on that legacy, you know, of just, <laughs> and it, it's the, a couple things popped up. Like when you said it was just a safe place and you felt loved, um, just I've been writing the last couple of days about emotional trust and 
you know, when you have someone that is willing to listen to, and you can pour your heart out and not feel criticized or, you know, or judged or, well, here's what you need to do or stop doing that or because they can't handle that. And your dad obviously just let you go and you felt safe. (laughs) You felt safe to open up. And now look, you provide that space for other people. And I think that is probably one of the reasons too that 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 connection, you know, that you felt it's easy for other people to feel connected by you. And it and that is a gift. And I think that's a great story, not only just as a parent-child relationship, but with all of our relationships, with our our peers, you know, our friends, um, just everywhere just allow people to just be them and provide a safe space by just listening. Maybe, (laughs) you know, not everybody is a coach or a therapist or anything like that, but we all have ears just to allow people to that safety net of, I hear you. Mm -hmm. I see you. And, And it was fascinating. I've often wondered where he got these skills because I don't know if he got it from his mom and dad, I, I did, they died when I was a baby, so I never met my grandma and grandpa on, on my dad's side. But my, my mom says that she thinks that he got a lot of it through his training, you know, in books, because they would read books together on parenting, you know, and how to how to do things better than the way they had been parented. But I think a lot of it was because he was so sensitive that he got, he probably looked back and thought, I didn't like that when that happened to me. So I'm going to do that differently, you know, with my kids. And um, because he, he told me other things about him that he had experienced. And he said, I'm never going to do that in my own personal life. So I think he probably did that as a parent too. And um, so I, I marvel at, cause he went through some really hard things as a, as a child and, and he came out just amazing. You know, he, he had some weaknesses, <laughs> you know, he, he got his feelings hurt <laughs> and it was hard for him to, to deal with that. And, um, and I saw him struggle, you know, in that way, but anyway. You mentioned that you're fascinated, um, like with people's behavior. Like, why do people behave the way they do? I've always been fascinated with that too. Almost <laughs> like sometimes, though, I'm like, okay, stop. You're overanalyzing. Like, well, why did they do that? Like, how could you? And I think some it's helped me though be aware that sometimes people are probably thinking that about us too. You know, oh, why? Right. Do- yeah. Why did she say that? What did she mean? Why did you, you know, and how we all do that a little bit, but I feel like, I I don't know. I wonder sometimes, is that a trait of us highly sensitive people? (laughs) Do we, I am curious about that. Like what makes people tick? Um, Yeah, totally. Why do they behave the way they do? And there's so much involved in that. It's just an interesting, interesting topic. Um, Tell me a little bit more. So say if you have a client and they come in and you spoke on the emotional regulation. And I feel, especially right now and after the last several years of the pandemic, and I just feel like mental health is a topic that is more approachable now, which is a great thing. It doesn't seem so... I, I don't even know the word. Like it, it just used to seem so like, oh, I don't want to talk about that. You know, we can talk about yeah. my heart attack or my, you know, whatever yeah. you know, I've got going on physically. But if I say, oh, I'm, I'm struggling mentally, people are like, okay, look at the time I have to go. Right. <laughs> right. I think, I think we have to just take it down a notch and that realize mental health is, is, a right way of thinking. It's a right way of managing our emotions. It's because if you are, you know, on the verge of tears all day long and you're stuck in sadness, if you are, you know, feeling lonely and isolated, if you are just feeling constantly, you know, that that mid-grade anxiousness or anger or irritability, and it's, you are projecting that in your life. And it really does start I mean, in our minds, it's, it's a meant that is, those are all mental health issues. Our emotions are. And I, I just, I feel that so much of our emotional, I don't know if you want to call them problems or issues, but a lot of it stems from, I have all these feelings and it's almost like we live in this society where 
I can't feel this way. I have to be happy all the time. I have to see everything positive. I can't go through anything negative. And the fastest way out, then life will be great. And I and I feel like it teaches us not to sit in that stuff and learn how to manage our emotions. I mean, our emotions are a, a fantastic thing, whether they're good or bad. It's just it's just communication mm-hmm. with ourselves. Mental health is is a pandemic issue now, and and they you know the the, the rates of mental health crises is, is so high. People can't even get in to see therapists because it is so it's just so rampant, and um, and people don't have these tools. They don't, they haven't been taught. They weren't role modeled these things. Um, and, and like you said, it, it sometimes when I reach out to people and I share my feelings, it is like, oh, I got to go, you know, <laughs> so sorry. And, um, and, and sometimes people don't even know how to receive and how to listen and how to sit with somebody. One of my favorite things is, is when somebody can just be with me, you know, when, when I'm hurting, just, just be with me, just sit by me. And, and just knowing that they're there, they don't even have to say anything, although I love it when they say something, but, <laughs> but there's a healing presence just, just knowing that they care. And even if they can't be with me, them just telling me that they care mm-hmm. it, and, and say they can't listen, they just send me a text, that is you know, very healing for me too. So that, that connection part is, like I said, that's, that's the most vital piece, I believe, for most people. It's the most vital piece for me. And um, and that's where we're we're lacking so much in in these days. We with COVID, you know, we had so much isolation with COVID. But then just the business of of this modern day, we just don't. How many times do we go talk to our neighbor? You know, it just doesn't happen very often. And and if we do talk, it's by text. You know, it's not as often that we hear their voice. I love to hear people's voices. And so um, so when a person is is very escalated in their emotions Mm -hmm. one of the things that um, most people want to do they don't like it (laughs) so it's usually because of a negative emotion it's fear it's anger it's grief there's some strong emotion that they're feeling and it's usually a negative emotion it's not like but but it can be that too sometimes people get they only they have a happiness meter that they can only handle so much happiness Mm -hmm. but usually it's it's a negative emotion so this quote quote negative emotion that is communicating with them they're like, get me out of here. <laughs> you know, they yeah. just want to escape from it as fast as possible. And so people that do know about positive thinking think, well, I'll just think a positive thought and I'll just, okay, okay, let's just go over here. And so even when I was talking about the camera, that wasn't the whole formula for me um, because part of it is accepting the emotion and feeling the emotion. Now I had felt the emotion plenty. <laughs> So when I got that message, it was it wasn't like I had not felt it. I had felt it a lot. So I was ready to move on. But that's the thing. It has to be when a person's ready. So a lot of times when a person has gone through trauma or something that is acutely painful or something that's long-term painful, like say they're dealing with, you know, a family member that has an addiction or a family member that has a disability or their own addiction or disability or something, a health issue that just is chronic and just goes on for a long time. Sometimes these um, lengthy periods of adversity, it's very difficult because the the emotions are just so strong. And so the first thing is that a person needs to feel valid in the way that they feel. So a lot of times when someone will, like even a child, they'll tell you, you know, my teacher hates me (laughs) or whatever, and they feel afraid, you know, that they're going to be rejected by their teacher or they're not going to be loved by their teacher. Many times a parent will want to say, I'm sure your teacher doesn't feel that way. And and so the the immediate reaction is, I shouldn't feel that way. I'm wrong for feeling that way. And what the brain does, it says, oh yeah? Well, let me tell you all the reasons why that teacher hates Mm -hmm. me because she looked at me that way and because she, yesterday, you know, she didn't choose me when she chose those other people or whatever. Our brain starts to kick in and it starts to create evidence of why our belief is true. And as we continue to think that thought over and over again, it becomes a belief. Then that limiting belief can then affect us. Many times these limiting beliefs that we have, we're not even conscious of. And yet they drive the thoughts that we have. And then that drives our feelings and affects our actions because of that. So uncovering those things starts with acknowledging what the feeling is. Naming it definitely helps to to reduce that escalation. They say name it to tame it because just having a name for something 
provides understanding. And I also think it provides validity because there's like a like when you're sick and you, you're trying to figure out what's going on and you go to doctor after doctor, test after test, when they finally give you a diagnosis, it's like, okay, there's a reason for this. <laughs> and so when there's a name for an emotion, it's like a diagnosis. Oh, okay, so that's, I feel, oh, I'm feeling grief. Oh, that's what's going on. Oh my goodness, okay. And then you can, you, you decrease that escalation of emotion and then you're ready to hear something else and maybe you can hear that some validation maybe you're able to hear that you have a right to feel the way that you do not that not that you're even assessing the situation correctly i might be because of a limiting belief i might not be seeing it right but my feeling is still valid because it's based on my reality because of my belief and because of my thought if i had a different thought about it i'd feel a different way but this is how i feel right now and if somebody validates that Again, that's part of that safety. Then I feel loved, I feel cared about. And so then I further de-escalate. And then, then at that point, then I am ready to say, is there a different way to look at this? And so, um, and then that's part of the reframing process where you can say, well, maybe there's a, a blessing in this hard thing that I'm going through. But it, But it's interesting because when those feelings are acute or when it's long-term, a lot of times it takes repeated processes of pouring out and being validated because they probably experienced a lot of invalidation, you know, in the past. And so they have to feel safe enough. And many times when someone is validated, they'll say back, the response is like, well, what makes you think that? Or why would you say that? Because they need some more evidence. And so then when the person's ready, then I help them find evidence of what that new way of looking at it is like, is, is it possible that there could be, you know, a blessing in disguise here? And, and then have you ever seen anybody else have a blessing in disguise when they went through a hard thing? You know, so we then we, we do that process. Mm -hmm. And um, so and then the mindfulness piece is very important because a lot of times when there aren't words or when we are so escalated, the mindfulness, maybe we feel it in our body before we ever recognize the thought or the feeling. I, I recognize feelings first versus the body. So then I have to go into my body and say, where do I feel it in my body? What's going on, you know, in there with me? And then when I'm trying to uncover some limiting beliefs or I'm trying to um, cement a new belief, that mindfulness and the meditation practice really helps me because then I'm able to, um, sometimes I rewrite the past <laughs> and I'll take a situation with the skills that I have now and I'll envision it in my mind and I'll, I'll redo the whole story <laughs> and yeah. talk about healing. That is, that has been a very healing um, experience for me. And sometimes mm -hmm. I don't just rewrite it. Sometimes now with the skills that I have and the understanding that I have, I go back to little Karen <laughs> and with with knowing what i know now and i say oh that person was just doing the best they could in that situation i got my feelings hurt but i didn't understand that they were just role modeling what they had been you know <laughs> what they had been taught and so it wasn't because they didn't care about me it was because that was what they had been taught and they didn't know a different way and so then i can then it's easier for me to forgive and to have compassion for that person so for me compassion is a really big key when I'm ready, I have to get de-escalated <laughs> and I have to see it differently. And then I move into the compassion and then I'm able to forgive. And then, then the miracle is when the Lord helps me to remember those tools, to be able to forgive and to truly feel it in my heart and then to let it go. It's a process. It is a process. I, there was a couple words that really stuck with me and that was, well, the both sides of it is the connection um, and then, you know, the disconnection flip side of that, which I'll get to, but then also, you know, validating and invalidating. And I feel so many of our relationships suffer because we invalidate other people so often. And I truly believe that most of us don't even realize we're doing it. When I, right. when my eyes were open to this a couple of years ago, I thought, wow, my husband and I do this to each other all the time. And a lot of it is because you're trying to make the other person feel good 
you know, like mm-hmm. you gave, you know, you know, the kid, oh, my teacher, whatever. Well, your teacher doesn't really mean that. That, that is invalidating. Mm-hmm. You're actually hurting that person by saying that because people do get on the defense. Well, what do you mean? Um, you know, and I found that was everywhere in our home. And you, you're doing it to try to help that other person not to feel bad, change mm-hmm. kind of the narrative to soften, you know, whatever they were going through. But all you need to do is say, really? Tell me how. And then they might start to talk through it. That right there is validating someone. Like, oh, I hear that this is a problem for you. So no matter what it is, someone comes to you. Oh, really? Tell me more. Well, what does that feel like? Well, then what else happened? And huh, you know, what are you going to do about it? It's those simple little things. We don't have to come up and fix everything for everyone else. And when we try to do that, we're invalidating someone, they get on the defense. And often what happens is that connection is broken because people shut down. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Right. And so the connection and the invalidation, I, I think that they just, they're so hand in hand, but I, I love to come at everything from the angle also of to really heal through things. It's going inward in our relationship with ourselves. And when I did that, I started to realize I was disconnected with myself and I was constantly invalidating myself. You know, if if I don't want to be highly sensitive, if I want to have this thick skin, then Jamie, you know, you just take everything so personal, just stop, you know, and, and I just try to get rid of anything uncomfortable. And it's like, the more that you do that, you're invalidating yourself, but then you you just kind of lose that connection with yourself. And how do you show up and have, deep relationships or anything meaningful with anyone else, how do you expect to connect with someone else when you're so disconnected from yourself? So I love that you, you know, tie that in. And I, I, and I feel even when you said that about, you know, who really goes out to talk to their neighbors anymore, if you need something, you text or this or that, there's not that connection of just, Hey, what's going on. And it's those simple things that, of course, are isolating, but having that human interaction in a place where you are validated, you have that connection. I mean, if I have to wrap it right back around with a bow to the emotional, you know, regulation and things like that, that is just everyday acts of managing our emotions, regulating them. I mean, how how do we expect to, to do that all on our own without being able to really open up and connect with real people. And I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times and I, and I love it. It's a brilliant statement, but we are in a time where we are connected to everyone, but connected to no one. And it's, it's scary. And I feel like mental health and all of that stuff is so on the rise. This should be a time when we are feeling, you know, really connected to people because we have access to it, but, yeah. Yeah, I was I was gonna say it's it's kind of interesting because um that piece of 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 validation, you know, where where somebody is listening, tell me more. That feels so good when someone wants to know. And then the next step when they express that they understand and they let me know how they understand. Like if they say, Oh, you know, yeah, I see you're sad, that's one thing. And that feels that's nice when they can recognize it. But when they say, Oh, I I'm sorry you feel sad. I, I care about you. And they express mm-hmm. some concern for me feeling sad. And then when they say, I felt sad too. I'm like, we are one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we are together. And I feel I feel a unity there. And that that unity of not being disconnected mm-hmm. and feeling that we are one is I think one of the most powerful healing aspects of the validation because. If I if I have just one person in this world that cares about me and and loves me and understands me, I can do like practically anything. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and it's when and, and but but like you said, the connection to myself is really important because when I would say I shouldn't be I shouldn't be so sensitive, you know, mm-hmm. I shouldn't get my feelings hurt, I should be over it. Those were invalidating statements that I was making to myself, and it was interesting because. Um, as I had children, 
I worked really hard. Like I have very sensitive children. All four of my children are very sensitive in different ways. And I would, I immediately started telling them what a gift it was that they were so sensitive. And, and I point out the different ways whenever I see it, I'm like, I, I love that about you. I love that thing. But I remember one time um, when one of my children were struggling and I was, you know, telling them, I was validating them and trying to help them process their pain. And then fairly soon after that, I was going through something. <laughs> I was talking to my my daughter and I was saying the shit thing. I shouldn't be, you know, this offended. I sh and, she, and here I am, you know, I practice this. I know this. It's conscious that my brain just defaulted in this moment of escalation. And my daughter said, would you say that to me if I felt that way? <laughs> and I said, oh, it just quick brought me back. Back. I was in my amygdala. I went right to the prefrontal cortex. Never, I would never say that to you. And she said, Well, then don't say it to yourself. And I was like, Yes, I need to love and validate myself. But but I had defaulted to that pattern that I had had for and, the, and that what I had heard, you know, for so many yeah. years. But so that's something that I work on constantly. That's something mm -hmm. that um, being connected with myself and 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 having that self-love and that self-compassion, mm -hmm. you know during those times when I'm escalated. I think with the invalidation too, I mean, really stop and ask yourself, has there ever been a time when someone invalidated you or you invalidated yourself and it made you feel better? <laughs> no. no. It always <laughs> makes us feel worse. It makes the other. Right. So, note to everyone, right? It makes ourselves <laughs> feel worse if we invalidate ourselves. Anytime we invalidate someone else, it makes them feel worse. It, you know, kind of puts, I don't know, just tension in, in all connections. But I don't, I, I still just think it's something we do that we're not aware of. And I definitely agree. It's like, it's because it has, there's a, people have the best of intentions. They want to cheer us up. They want to help us feel better. And sometimes they feel uncomfortable with us not feeling better. <laughs> and so they're, but usually they have the best of intentions in trying to do that. And most of the time it's because that's what they heard, you know, for mm -hmm. But just even giving someone then, it, it kind of goes back, just giving someone that, that safe space just to get it off their chest, you know, and listen and well, what makes you feel that way? And I understand. And it's just those little simple things. We don't need to jump in and try to rescue, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I I, I didn't even know we were going to go that route about the invalidation, but I love it because <laughs> I, I do. I, I, I do. I just feel like it's, it's one of those topics we don't hear enough of. And whenever... Like, you know, whether whatever feeling it is you have, if you're sad about something or you're anxious, you know, uptight or angry, just talking to someone that's there to listen when you're done, it's went down several notches. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, I mean, I'm sure everybody can think of their relationships right now. And maybe this is a good thing. You can see now relationships that you feel validated in, in relationships that you feel invalidated in. And I think it's worth noting, okay, when I really have something, there are certain people that are safer to go talk to. I'm not saying that the other people are bad people or anything, right. but going into that, if you've got something, you're wrangling, okay, this is a safe person. I feel validated. I can get it off my chest. And when I leave that conversation, I feel better, not worse. Because having people to talk through things with really does help us with our mental and emotional health. And, yes. but we have to guard ourselves too. And we have to know, you know, the capacity of other people. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, yeah. yeah. Because there are people that don't have the skills and they don't know, they just aren't able to, mm -hmm. to be, you know, to hear us, to, to see us and to and to support us, you know, in the ways that we need. And so, yes, it's very important to be wise and to set those boundaries, you know, because um, not everybody does have have the same, like you said, the same capacity or the same capability. And mm -hmm. so that doesn't mean they can't learn it, but and and sometimes they learn through practice. <laughs> but but it is it is important to be able to to know that you have somebody that is safe that you can trust, and that's. That's a huge element. 
Mm -hmm. And even you mentioned the boundaries. And I think a lot of that, it's just, it's our boundaries with ourselves of, um, you know, what to share with who. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, what's the, oh, there's the, um, is it Albert Einstein that says, you know, something about the crazy person is, is the person that just keeps doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. And I laugh at that because it's probably in every self-development book, but it is so true. Look at us. Right. You know? right. <laughs> we keep doing the same things that are causing, you know, anxiety or this problem or whatever it is we're dealing with. Huh. Maybe I ought to try something different. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like right. I'm so stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and even even thinking about it differently, maybe I should think about this differently, you know, and exactly. I think that's that's one of the reasons why I think life coaching is so valuable is because sometimes we don't have a person either that has the ability or the capability or the time or the availability. Sometimes we just don't have somebody like that. And I, I remember when I um, worked with my first life coach, it was glorious. It was it was just absolutely glorious. And and she did help me to see things differently. And I, so I, I have, I have benefited myself from having a life coach. Um, my best friend is a therapist. <laughs> oh, <yes>. so, <laughs> yeah, what a blessing for me. She wasn't yeah. a therapist when I met her, but, but she, I, I kept telling her, you should be a therapist. You yeah. are such a natural. And she did become yeah. a therapist. <laughs> That's awesome. But, yeah. That's great. So Karen, where, what's that? I was gonna say it's wonderful when people use their gifts in a I way know. that that blesses others. Yeah, you're being generous. That's what I always tell myself on those days when I feel like, oh, you know, like do I, you know, you doubt yourself. It's be generous with your gifts. They were put on you, you know, put in you for a reason. So share them, right? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So tell us, Karen, where can we find you? Um, yeah. So, um, so I have a podcast and my podcast is called The Hero Within. And we talk about stories of transformation and about finding our gifts and about finding hope and inspiration through challenging experiences and becoming aligned with our true self. And I also have a website, KarenHallCoaching.com. And um, you can find me there too. Okay. So I look forward to any questions. Absolutely. Tell me what are last question, what are um like what are your niche areas for life coaching? So I do parenting coaching with helping parents help their children to emotionally regulate, which always ends up being helping the parent learn to emotionally regulate. So I do a lot of emotional intelligence um coaching. And I also I do have some um people that I coach with business because business is all about relationships and so mm -hmm the same messages you know impact business but it's all relationship coaching is what i do perfect beautiful well thank you so much for your time i enjoyed this conversation and i bet our listeners did too thank you <laughs> well thank you it's my pleasure to be here thank you so much for being here as we kick off this podcast together i really appreciate you joining me on this journey because i'm well aware you could be doing or listening to anything right now Hey, if you enjoy the Authentically Raw content, please support the show by following, rating, and reviewing on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. You can also follow me on social media for daily inspiration. Head over to my website, jamiebarris.com, to sign up for weekly transformation tips. Or if you're interested in coaching, I currently have three openings for one-on-one -on -one coaching. If you're looking for an empowering community, we'd love for you to join us in the Transformation Tribe our group coaching membership. More info available on my website under the life coaching and membership tabs. One last thing, I'm rooting for you. Be real, be raw, be authentic.